Hello everyone, welcome back to chapter 1 part 2. In this part we will talk about when should the government intervene in the economy. Let's get started. So here's our roadmap, we talked about this before and in part 1 we covered these two items and now we are covering four key questions in public finance. So question number one, when should the government intervene in the economy? In this part we are covering this. Second question, how might the government intervene? What tools does the government have? The third question is, what's the effect of these interventions on economic outcomes? And the last one is, why do governments choose to intervene in the way that they do? So these three, question two, three, and four will be in the next part. Let's get started. When should the government intervene in the economy? So normally, competitive private markets yield efficient outcomes. We say economically efficient outcomes. So this is what it looks like. This is the quantity of a good or service sold price per unit. This could be quantity of cars sold. So you have a demand for labor that looks like somebody is. So it's supposed to be a downward sloping straight line demand curve and this is the supply curve for cars okay this is the market market for i don't know why it does that for cars okay supply and demand curves intersect yield optimal level of output which is the equilibrium e for equilibrium quantity we also put e here for equilibrium right remember your principles classes this is the price that clears the market at this price level quantity demanded is exactly equal to quantity supplied market clears everybody's happy right so normally competitive private markets uh, yield Econ economically efficient outcomes so in these cases right it's hard to justify government intervention in markets if you have a market that's working well everybody's happy with the outcome no need for government to intervene for instance government doesn't intervene in let's say justin bieber canceling his world tour right international tour right because why should the government intervene in a private decision but there are two main justifications or exceptions. Number one is market failures. So it causes the market economy to deliver an outcome that does not maximize efficiency. So whenever you have market failures, there's a justification for government intervention. In case of health insurance, government requiring people to have health insurance and having them access to affordable health insurance. And second one is redistribution. So how the economic pie is shared is called redistribution. So if government thinks, okay, we need to, for instance, make a Dr. G, professor of economics, to pay certain taxes. I do pay a lot. And then we're going to actually subsidize public education, college education. Did you know that you as a student only pay one third of the real, it's expensive, college is expensive, but you pay one third of the total cost of education who pays the two thirds this is the taxpayers so this is an example of redistribution so uh, texas a and corpus christi we have so many students you guys are paying one third of the education that's an example of redistribution of resources so it's taking from the students who are relatively poorer right i'm not saying you're poor but you have limited income your families might have income but Education could be something that you're taking on on your own and government might think, OK, two thirds uh, should be paid by taxpayers. So let's talk about market failures. So in 2007, this is an example of a market failure. Forty five million people were without health insurance in the United States. So this is more than 10 percent. This is like 17.2 percent of non-elderly population that's a lot of people with no insurance so lack of insurance what we will learn about this this is called negative externalities uh, we're going to learn about this in chapter five it's coming up so lack of insurance creates negative externalities uh, from for instance contagious diseases right so you decide not to have insurance impose costs on others 
So the uninsured may not take account of their impact on others. For instance, um, before 2007, people actually used to declare bankruptcy due to lack of insurance. They just, somebody in the family got cancer and hospital bills $200,000. They had to declare uh, bankruptcy. They they wanted to buy insurance, but insurance was really expensive. For instance, my insurance is provided for uh, me by my employer, but not everybody is this lucky. So government created marketplaces. Okay, so let's talk about modern measles epidemic. So measles vaccine was introduced in 1963. The measles ceased to uh, exist in the United States in 1980s, right? Uh, cases were really rare. So in 1989, 91, there's a huge resurgence in measles cases, huge outbreak, okay? So this is due to very low immunization rates among disadvantaged inner city youth. So this is not anti-vaxxer movement or anything. This is literally people didn't have access to the vaccine they would otherwise take. I'm not talking about people who are um, deliberately rejecting this vaccine. This is people who would take the vaccine. They didn't know they didn't have access. So unimmunized children in this case Im impose a negative externality on other children. The federal government responded to this health crisis in 1990s and encouraged parents to immunize their children, paid for the vaccines for low-income families. So what happened is that results were really cool. Immunization rates uh, were higher than 70% uh, prior to the outbreak and rose to 90% by 1995. Again, you can't really get 100% compliance with vaccines, especially nowadays because of a movement of people who are not willing to vaccinate. Okay, so government inter intervention in this case clearly reduced the negative externality that due to lack of resources or lack of information. So the second reason why uh, government should intervene is redistribution. So again, in your tuition example, right, you're paying one third of your total college cost, taxpayers paying two thirds of your college cost. So what's the, what is the redistribution? What does it aim to do? Redistribution is shifting of resources from some groups to society, your professor to you, to the others. So when government cares about not only size of the economic pie, so this is like your the, uh, the size of your economy, gross domestic product, but also how it is distributed, size of each person's slice of that pie. Okay, so society, for instance, may value additional one dollar of consumption by a poor person more highly than one dollar consumption of a rich person. Okay, so I'm not necessarily rich, but I am probably for sure, definitely, I make more money than an average college student. So government feels like, okay, we're going to tax Dr. G. I pay a lot of taxes, a lot, which I'm proud of because, you know, that's my... Uh, duty as a citizen but government might think that one dollar will be more valued put towards education to support our students that's an example of redistribution so redistribution example of the uninsured people three quarters of the families with the incomes uh, below the median income level in the u.s so what's the median household income in the u.s it's about 70 71 thousand dollars uh, per family nowadays and imagine having family of five okay imagine everybody's insurance premium being one thousand dollars you have a family with insurance premium 5k a month 12 months that's sixty thousand dollars okay so this is just the cost of insurance for your family of course right but also i, I just made up a, a hypothetical case but also Government created marketplaces to buy insurance that is reasonably priced, okay? So society may feel that it's appropriate to redistribute from those with insurance, with higher incomes to those without insurance. So whenever I pay taxes, right, I'm giving my money to government. Government decides to start a program that is redistribution to benefit people with lower incomes. Redistribution often involves efficiency losses. Keep this in mind. Is it the most efficient Maybe not, but 
you are achieving a more educated population. Okay, so redistribution can change a person's behavior, such as it can actually force a first generation person to motivate him or her to go to college. Okay, so as you have seen in labor economics courses, go to the education chapter we covered in labor economics uh, videos. People with college education make much more. They double the earnings of the high school graduates. So it makes a huge difference, okay? So I am basically, I don't feel bad about paying taxes. It goes benefits the college students. I'm happy because we are going to create wealthy future generations. So they'll be paying more taxes, hopefully my retirement. Okay, so taxing the rich to redistribute money to the poor could cause both groups to work less hard. So this is a fact, you know, every policy has pros and cons. So I could think like, okay, I'm a professor, but I'm going to stop working because of this. That's a behavioral, behavioral response, which I'm not going to do. Okay. So we are done with part two. I'll see you in part three, where we will talk about the other important questions we ask in public finance. How do government intervenes in economy? What's the effect of these interventions and why do governments choose to intervene? So know about these questions, okay? So when should the government intervene? How might the government intervene? What's the effect of these interventions? Why do governments choose to intervene the way they do? These are four questions. I'll see you in the next part.